OK. So my topic is scientific performance of dynamically interactive infrastructures. So the general motivation of my study uh, is based on the fact that uh, our infrastructure systems are in general modeled in a simplified manner. And sometimes many advanced interactive um, dynamic phenomena are not considered at all. And this can lead to problems, just the lack of understanding to our infrastructure systems and the, uh, the lack of information to the various uncertainties associated with the, these information, uh, with these problems, can lead to either over designed structures or unsafe structures. Okay. So the lack of understanding may either lead to an over-designed structure or an unsafe structure. So in light of that, the uh, motivation of my thesis is to investigate the various aspects of these advanced interactive phenomena, and we have summarized all common shared themes among uh, these various problems. They are interactive structures or coupled structures, coupled nonlinearities, coupled multi hazard, and aging and failing. So for each of these four themes, we have picked up randomly or not randomly uh, one representative problems that are relevant to uh, the other wider applications that, and we have investigated these problems. So for the first theme, which is interactive structures, we have featured uh, this configuration that is typically found from a real natural gas processing plant. So basically, we have these two structures, structure A and structure B, interconnected by a pipe element, which, which is pressurized and has two 90 degree elbows. Um, and the different dynamic characteristics of these two structures uh, can lead to out of phase oscillation during an earthquake and thus an elevated seismic demand on the key component, which is the elbows. So we call it uh, structured type structure interaction, which is quite fancy named, but uh, yeah. The methodology applied for this study is to use a numerical parametric study followed by a hybrid simulation. And the key findings, including uh, include an uh, improvement in understanding to key parameters governing the dynamic responses of the system and the impact of the variation. So these parameters include the various uh, geomet geometrical configuration for the type, the properties of the two structures, and properties of the earthquake. And we had, uh, as I said, the out of phase oscillation between the two structures can lead to elevated demand. Sometimes the demand can be really critical. And um, from an overall point of view, we say that for this kind of interactive system or the examination of this key component, we really need to model the, the true boundary conditions realistically so that we get the actual seismic demand. So here are uh, some details of, of this study. This is the full 3D numerical model. You can see the structure moving against each other. It's a simplified model based on which we perform our numerical parametric study. And this is a test condition model. Basically, we are simulating the restraining devices that, that are used in the lab. And this is the lab. Basically, this is an accelerated footage of the pseudo-dynamic hybrid simulation, where the uh, where the uh, physical substructure is the pipeline, which is key, the critical component in this problem, uh, and the two numerical, the two supporting structures are modeled in open system vertically. So basically, the results from the test showed that our numerical, value, uh, numerical simulation is uh, pretty robust and basically uh, validating the conclusions from based on the numerical climatic study. So this is the first one. The second theme is coupled nonlinearity. So for this study, we have featured a low-tech, low-cost seismic phase isolation device. We call it PVCS. So basically, it's a thin layer of sand encapsulated Within two PVC sheets, which is basically um, which basically allows the foundation to slide once the frictional threshold is exceeded during the earthquake. We have investigated uh, the impact of different levels of frictional resistance of 
the isolation interface. We have also investigated different levels of activity demand on the superstructure. And by the way, just to mention the uh, highest uh, what's that for the activity in the factor Q, uh, the behavior factor. Yeah, the highest behavior factor allowed by the euro code is 1.5. So basically, you are expecting if you are designed according to the euro code, you are expecting a near elastic uh, structure for base isolation. But for in other parts of the world, this is this not necessarily the case. So it is possible to implement a, a highly ductile uh, structure with uh, the application of uh, base isolation. So the methodology applied for this study is to use an um, analytical solution of the governing equation of motion of an equivalent four degree freedom system, followed by a comparative uh, incremental dynamic analysis performed. Uh, based on a full 3D detailed numerical model. And the key findings, basically we have proven that this low cost device, let's say, is effective even under a critical, that's uh, the worst case scenario, that there is a critical combination of a highly ductile superstructure and a high resistance on the uh, base isolation layer. And overall, for this kind of uh, highly uh, complicated uh, uh, system where nonlinearities are sourced from different uh, phenomena, we, uh, we have found out that it does really matter to model not only the nonlinearity of the base isolation layer, but also to model the activity, the ductile behavior of shoe structure as well. So basically, we have worked through uh, uh, a variety of different analytical or numerical models to the point when we think that we have a relatively robust and accurate representation of the actual thing. And based on that, we have proven the effectiveness of the PVCS system from both the local responses of structural components, as well as global response, global responses of the overall system in terms of IDA curves. The final, the third project is uh, about coupled mode cutting. So for this theme, we have selected to start us to study the industry standard NRU five megawatt wind turbine, uh, which is supported on a monocloud foundation. So we have studied the performance of such a such a system under the joint load of earthquake, wind, and wave. And we have also studied the long-term behavior of um, such a system in terms of the, um, by means of explicitly modeling the uh, corrosion of the tower and the scouring of the soil foundation system. The methodology applied for this study is to use a Latin hypercube based, 12 based, uh, Latin hypercube sample, 12 based fragility analysis. So it's purely numerical. And the key findings include, first, basically we have found that there is a probability of failing a certain criteria for this system under the uh, exposure to only design level earthquakes plus design level wind and wave load. And we've, we've got also improved understandings to the optimal selection of statistical regression methods, as well as intensity measure pairs for the purpose of uh, multi hazard probability uh, evaluating multi hazard probability function. We have also got improved understandings to the time evolution or age dependency of such multi, uh, multi hazard probability functions. So, overall, finally, for structures that is susceptible to multiple hazards, it is always advisable to simulate all of the hazards simultaneously and accurately so that, yeah, basically. And here are some, some of the details of this uh, study. Uh, basically, we have modeled our uncertainties explicitly through a Latin hypercube sampling approach. The various um, model parameters that govern the uh, response of the system is sampled randomly, and we, have, we are able to control the statistical distribution of these parameters, as well as the correlation between them. So this, this uncertainty for these 
parameters include the properties of the wind, the wave, the properties of the structure and the soil, the directionality of the earth. And this is how we model the whole system. Basically, we have taken advantage of two separate numerical tools. One is called open fact, the other is open seas. So one is good at simulating the aerohydrothermoelastic response of, of the turbine, whereas the other is better at simulating the nonlinear dynamics of the structure plus the foil structure interaction aspect of the problem. Um, in terms of improving the state of the art for multi hazard productivity functions, there are other uh, previous studies of results that are available. However, none of them have considered that the uh, none of them none of them have considered the full operational wind range of the wind speed uh, of the wind turbine, and at the same time consider and at the same time, oops. And at the same time, consider the active blade control mechanism, which is quite typical for uh, most modern day wind turbines. So these, these questions are addressed in this study. Um, and, and finally, uh, concerning aging, we have answered the question of how do offshore wind turbine fragility functions deteriorate over, deteriorate over time by constructing these time dependent fragility functions. Uh, Basically, this kind, of, this kind of information may be useful for uh, wind turbine owners to decide if their unit uh, can need maintenance or needs to be demolished. Or uh, this time can either be too early or can be uh, delayed safely. So yeah. And and these are the other investigators involved in this study. So far. So yeah. Thank you very much. For your patience. Thank you for the saving some time. Hi, everyone. My name is Jorge Paredes. So today I'm going to deliver a, a presentation about non ergodic ground motion model for South America. So in the, because I am a, a, in the middle of my second year as a PhD student, so I'm going to provide my motivation, my research, and also the objectives of the main streams of my research, and also what, what I'm still working on it. So that's why I'm hoping that next year we'll have more results just to show it to you. So as we know, a peak ground acceleration is one of the most common intensity measure that is used, and we can found also in the seismic codes. So we, we we'll grab a code and we take it and we, we can play with it. We can amplify it and we can also use the, the fundamental view of the structure and just well, play with it and just obtain the, the ground motion for design. But in this case, how we obtain this data? So as we know, this uh, in the case of peak ground acceleration, we rely on the application and probabilistic seismic hazard assessments in which it is long equation. But in the case that there's one part, which is the most important thing, that is that one, which is relies on ground motion models. And ground motion models are the equation that relate the intensity measure and with different parameters, which can be the moment magnitude, the side effect of the soil. So there are many parameters that I'm going to talk about. But in this case, specifically, for example, in the global earth model, you can see that the PGA have been estimated for many regions around the world. And they use some uh, foreign or non-local non ground motion models uh, in the development of, for the application of the estimation in this case for uh, the probability faster assessment. So that's why uh, ground motion, uh, sorry, ground motion models are the key uh, empirical component on the estimation on any intensity measure. So, but the thing is that in the case of South America, because I'm from Peru and we can feel tremors uh, every time, so it permits them to use it. So, in, in South America, uh, there are many countries uh, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Chile, Argentina, uh, Venezuela, that uh, we share the same subduction zone in which the, the NASA plates abduct the continental plates. 
So there are many earthquakes that we can uh, measure for accelerometers that have been installed recently. There are many accelerometers that have been installed. So, but there are some issues when we will try to use non-local ground motion models to estimate the, P, the PGA. And this issue would be because these ground motion models, uh, because we some region uh, doesn't have too much data, so we combined the, the recorded data uh, from a, a station in which the accelerometers, so we recorded data, and then we mix all the data. You know? For example, we can have uh, we have the production zone in, in Japan. Uh, we have a station, or we have a station also in Chile, in Peru, uh, any country. So we mix all the data. And then we develop these ground motion models that we use in order to predict the acceleration. But the thing is that there are some issues when we try to use these uh, non-local ground motion models. And these issues are, for example, in the case for South America, uh, there is a real, real, real differentiation of ground motion, subduction ground motion model, which is in this case Arteta. So this is a recent ground motion model for the subduction zones, in which uh, we try to use this to predict. In this case, what would be the intensity measure in terms of PGA? So there are some issues, and this, these issues can be evaluated in terms of the residuals. So what are the residuals? The residuals are the differentiation between the observed and the predicted results. So the observed is what we measure from the accelerometers, and the predicted are obtained from the GMPs. You know? So that differentiation are the residuals. So in this case, when uh, some of the data were tested, in the southern part of South America, and specifically in Chile, uh, there were more positive residuals or more values that were positive. So that means if we take the mean, we can have some of the predicted PGA in the southern part of South America, Chile specifically. And we go to the north, uh, we have more value or more negative residuals. That means that we're going to under predict the PGA. But there is a transition point between uh, Chile and Peru that we have practically the same number between positive and negative. So we, we can say that this is a transition point, and which is the best scenario when the ground motion predicts very well in this case the PGA. So we can we can find that if we try to use ground motion models that were developed using different ground motion from different regions, and then we want to apply this equation to predict. Uh, intensity measure for regions and lack of this ground motion model, we can have some kind of issues in this case. So I'm going to go deeply about it in the next slide. Uh, so ground motion model I was talking about, ground motion models is practically the key empirical component of PSHA applications. And this is the equation, the common equation that we can see. So we have the, the Y, which is the intensity measure. And we also, in the, the right hand side of the equation, we have the terms that are to say, classify a source path. Sorry. We have the source, uh, the path, and the side term, plus and error. So if we want to uh, plot this equation, we're going to have that in the vertical, you have the intensity measure that can be not only PGA, can be peak ground velocity, it can be mean period. There are there is many intensity measures that are going to present next in the next slides. And in the R component, which is in the X direction of the plot, uh, we have the it's associated with the distance, but this is related to the three main input parameters that are the source, path, and side effects. And the most common parameters that are used for ground motion models are the moment magnitude for the source. The distance in this the rational distance for the path and the side effects based on BM30 for the side. So that's most, the most common parameters that are used. And we have also the error term, which is in, in this case are estimated based on residuals analysis. So we can have we're talking about in the, in the previous slides. Okay, so but the thing is that because we have more data or we have more uh, accelerometers that have been installed. So now it's, it, we can say that this error term can be explicit into two types of error. One is associated to the error for the model, which is the epistemic uncertainty or model uncertainty. And the other one is the random uncertainty that, well, definitely it's something that we can get rid, 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 rid of on the record. So that's why uh, it is important to reduce this random uncertainty and increase 
the epistemic uncertainty, sorry, or model uncertainty. And how are we gonna do that? Adding more input parameters in the source and path and side effects. So that's why ground motion models have become more complex. They have more input parameters in order to uh, better estimate the epistemic uncertainty, reduce the error uncertainty, and reduce the total standard deviation from the ground motion models. So that's why the total error term nowadays is explicit in, in two types of error. Uh, it's explicit into the inter-event variability, which is associated with the source, plus uh, a random variability. And also we have the inter-event variability, which is associated with the path and side effect, plus the, also the random variability. So that's why now we can talk about that there are two types of uh, ground motion models. We have ergodic ground motion models and we have non-ergodic ground motion models. The first one is the most common one. The first is just to uh, regress or to obtain a ground motion model, combining data from different regions around the world, and then assume that this can be applicable to any location of the region that lack of this information. So that's why we have this ergodic assumption. In contrast, non-ergodic models is when we have a region, we collect as many data as we can, and then we develop a ground motion model specifically for that region, and then we can also obtain a fixed and fixed coefficient because ergodic assumptions fix their coefficient and they are applied to any region. But the thing is that there are some coefficients of the, the term, are some coefficients from the terms that are, are written. Regionalized, so it can vary depending on the region. So that's why this coefficient even can vary from the same country. So that's why it's important to rely now in, in these non ergodic assumptions. So that means that we want to have an equation in which we have the general equation and this coefficient can vary according to the region. So that's why a non ergodic gram motion model cares about uh, to reduce the random uncertainty and to increase the epistemic uncertainty. So that's why at this point, uh, my main objectives are four. Uh, and I'm going to talk about each of them in the next slide. The first one is to construct a compiled database for South America. That's why you can see here in this table that we have different networks around South America, so I have to, to get data from each network. But the thing is that some of them also are not available, so I have to contact them and also give me some kind of access to get the data. But I still uh, waiting for some networks also to make an agreement and get more data. So that's why at the moment, for South America, I collected around 70, 75,000 records from around 8,200 uh, 8, events. But I still, uh, my, my objective is at the, at, at the end of this year to, re, to collect more data. So I, I expect to recover up to maybe 100,000 records and more events. So, and then I'm going to treat all this uh, data. Uh, it was the second, my second, my second is the goal, which is to process the data in order to reduce the variability is because I'm going to obtain the intensity measure, not only PGA, maybe other intensity measure. So that's why it's important to process the data, take out the noise uh, based on correctly the, the, the data, and also try to recover, uh, try to recover or minimize the removal of the signals, try to uh, estimate the low cut frequency that maybe can vary for each record. So in order to apply a uh, better for the design for the design of long long uh, period of structures, uh, <clears throat> and also you can see here that there there these are the list of the different intensity measures that also I'm planning to consider uh, in the development of the ground motion. Not only for PGA, you can have different uh, the parameters, and there are uh, innovative ones like the effective amplitude spectrum that is. Better from well, this recent paper have shown that it's better compared to the other ones. So, and then uh, after having all this uh, data 
uh, treated, then I have to evaluate the input parameters. So the input parameters, I'm talking about the, the source, uh, the path and the side effects. That's why it's important to see what kind of uh, parameters I'm going to use in order to provide a better fit, fit for the ground motion model for South America. So that's why nowadays that we can we can see that we have more nonlinear terms instead of linear. So in order to improve the performance of the ground motion models and also uh, apply different uh, separate statistical techniques in order to estimate a specific coefficients that uh, are specific for that region, for example, for the case of the geometric spreading or the elastic attenuation in, in the case we have to evaluate the path effects in the in the path term of the equation. Uh, that's why also we have different steps of well, just a complex topic about here. Okay, and also the coefficients that are going to be estimated also should be validated by empirical evidence because also there are some uh, stochastic simulation that maybe have been applied and also have to validate the analytic attenuation, for example, in some cases in order to provide a better fit of the of the gun motion model. And also it's important that I have to do a deep literature review. I have read more than 800 papers in order to come out or understand better all the side terms, how they they can be beneficial in order to reduce the, the uncertainty of the ground motion. So that's why it is important in a deep literature review about all these terms. And the final uh, objective of my research is then when I define all the input parameters and I'm going to include is uh, to come up with a, a equation that is suitable to South America. So well, it could be two scenarios. I can make a top or test some functional form that we may, would be suitable for South America, or just to come up with my own equation, just use an exploratory data analysis in order to come up with a proper uh, equation for South America specifically. Uh, and also, the, I think the least important that also I have to do a literature review or all the sustainable techniques that is going uh, to be uh, beneficial in order to develop, in this case, non ergodic gram motion model, and also to reduce the total standard deviation, which is the most important goal when we're going to develop these kind of models. And I think that's it. Yeah, thank, you, have, thank you all thank again. You. Hi, uh, I'm Yichen Zhang and Raphael and Nicholas are my supervisors. Uh, I'm going to present a uh, novel damping devices, uh, not damping device. It's proposed for application with the post tension frames or, I mean, the self centering structures. It's named sliding keys on um, inclined key flat in cantilever device, the key device. So, the self centering structures conceptually consists of two parts the self centering part plus a damping part. For example, the first figure shows a hysteretic curve of a post-tension frames. Uh, it can be seen as a post, I mean, self-centering part of a structure. And the second figure shows a hysteretic curve of a traditional damper. Uh, it has a triangle. Uh, it has a parallelogram shaped hysteretic uh, curve, and uh, it can be steel dampers or frictional-based damping devices. So the figure, the first figure plus the second figure, we can get the third figure. Uh, it's a dual flag-shaped hysteretic curve. So actually, it's a typical hysteretic curve of self centering structures. Uh, if we want, I mean, if we require a fully self centering, that means we hope the third figure only located at the first and third quadrant. Uh, so it means we hope the point A uh, almost at the origin. Uh, sorry, the, 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 the origin should this all should be idea. <laughs> okay, so uh, we hope the point A uh, almost at the origin. Uh, but it, if we use the traditional damping devices, that means the PT frame must have a large initial stiffness and the yield strength. Uh, so, so this is actually this is because the existence of the activation threshold uh, in the traditional dampers it, it can be 
the yield strength uh, of the steel dampers or the friction sliding activation force of the uh, frictional based devices. And the existence of this activation threshold also means uh, these devices can be only activated at large earthquakes. In small events, they can't be activated and cannot provide any damping. Besides, the steel stampers uh, will, I mean, uh, has residual stress after earthquakes. So if this element should need to be replaced after earthquakes, uh, the residual stress uh, may raise healthy concerns for workers. And for frictional de devices, uh, mirroring and ensuring the correct normal, normal force is problematic. So we proposed a new device. This device has a triangular shift hysteretic curve. Uh, so for these devices, uh, there isn't activation threshold, there isn't residual stress after earthquakes, and we don't need to provide a normal force at the stage of installation. Uh, this device provides two functions for the PT frame. Uh, there are additional stiffness and additional hysteretic damping. Uh, so the, this figure, uh, the, 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 the part, I mean, in the, in the right box, uh, is a conceptual configuration of this device. It consists of sliding keys and wedge shaped slope blocks strings and a rigid box to, to provide restraints. Uh, the behavior of the ski device controlled by three core parameters, the friction coefficient and the slope angle beta and the print stiffness. So by training these two these three parameters, we can get two types of hysteretic curves. The first type uh, is uh, solid lines in the right figure. Uh, the curve located at all four quadrants. Uh, it happens when eta greater than one. The eta is controlled by uh, friction coefficient mu and slope angle beta. And another type is the the, the curve. Uh, the curve shown by the dashed line. It's only located as the first and the third quadrant. It happens when eta less than one. So if we use this device into the PT frame, uh, we can find that, I mean, uh, there, there will be no requirement on the initial stiffness and yield strength on the PT frame for the fully self-centering. OK, so this figure shows a uh, actual configuration of the device. Uh, it has three components. Uh, a sliding keys, that is the green one, and slow blocks, that is the red blocks, and cantilever bars, uh, that is gray bars. Um, compared with the conceptual configuration right here, uh, we use cantilever bars to shape the functions of two elements in this figure. Uh, that is the, the function of screen and the function of the rigid block. The function of screen uh, is shaped by the by the bending uh, by the bending stiffness of the cantilever bar around its weak axis, and the rigid case uh, is shaped by the bending stiffness of cantilever bars around its strong axis. Uh, for this actual configuration because we replaced a rigid element with a deformable element. So this replacement actually uh, must uh, in, uh, introduce some distortions on its uh, hysteretic curves. So uh, this figure, these two figures, shows the actual hysteretic curves of this configuration, or I would say uh, the hysteretic curve considering the deformable uh, cantilever bar. So uh, the blue lines is 
uh, the blue lines are the curves of the actual configuration, and the white lines are the idealized uh, hysteretic curve. Uh, so we can see that uh, because I mean because of the replacement, uh, it induces two distortions. The first one is the stiffness reduction, and the second one is the point of the 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 the, the position change of the point B. The point B is the start point of the unloading stage. So these two distortions uh, can be uh, can be quantified by two index alpha and rho. The alpha and rho uh, are controlled by friction coefficient mu, slope angle beta, and the section property of cantilever bars. The section property at here is iy over ix. Uh, if we use a small uh, slope angle beta and a large iy over ix, we can make alpha and rho greater than 0.95. That means these two distortions can be ignorable. We did some tests. Uh, all the specimens are 1 over 4 scaled in stroke and strength. And all the components are bolted together. And the fixed ends of cantilever bars are shaped by uh, by two angles and uh, hollow section tube. Uh, the fixed restraints actually provided by the friction force applied by that balance dot. We designed eight specimens. The skate A and skate B are used to, to verify the conception of the skate device. So the skate A is the eta greater than one, uh, that means you know, the curve uh, curve located at all four quadrants, and skate B is eta less than one. Uh, the hysteretic curve of it should be only located at the fourth and third quadrant. Other six specimens are using different parameters and different uh, friction surfaces. We designed two test protocols. The second one, and the, the right one, is a fatigue test. Uh, the fatigue loop has 100 cycles. We used string gates and LVDTs to record the local and global behaviors of the specimens. And this figure shows the global behavior. Okay, so the, actually this page just to, just to show uh, before failure, uh, the friction not sliding only happens uh, at where we want. These two figures show the hysteretic curve of skate A and skate B. The left one is a skate, way, a skate A where eta is greater than one. So we can see that it has a triangular shift hysteretic curve and uh, the curve located at all four quadrants. And most importantly, it's stable and repeatable. The right one is a curve of skate B. Uh, it's only located at the first and third quadrant, and it's also repeatable and uh, stable. Uh, but the skate B actually also uh, identify a failure mode. This failure happens at the, end, uh, at the fixed end of the cantilever bars. Uh, it's because the restraint strength of the of the fixed end uh, is not sufficient uh, in the test. So uh, the cantilever bar has a uncoverable rotation around its base. So we can see uh, an idle running around the origin and small stiffness degradation at two corners at the large loading displacement. But the important thing is that uh, the failure mode actually can be designed. I mean, we can assign a certain failure mode to this device. It can be this failure mode, and it also can be other modes. So it depends on which mode we want. Uh, these two figures show the comparison between theoretical estimation and physical set results. The right lines are the uh, theoretical envelopes estimated by equations, and blue lines are backbone curves 
of test results, we can see that the, these two curves match each other very well. OK, so then let's look at the specimens with different parameters. Uh, the first and the last two are using steel against brick lining for the frictional sliding phases, so surfaces. Uh, and other threes are using steel against metals. So from this group of figures, we can know that the steel against the brick lining uh, could give a most stable and smooth hysterical curves. Uh, and this one is using steel against steel. It has the least stable hysterical behaviors. And this group this group of tests also tell us that we can tune the, the properties or the behaviors of the skate device by changing the parameters. Then let's look at the fatigue behaviors of the skate device. The upper two are the specimens with steel against brick lining. And the lower two are the specimen with steel against the steel, and the 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 left two uh, the left two actually are uh, hysterical curves, and the right two are the relationship between force and uh, times. So uh, firstly, let's look at the upper two. Uh, from this one, we can see that uh, the specimen with brick linings exhibited stable hysterical performance without any stiffness or strength degradation. Uh, but compared with the steel, ag uh, steel against brick lining specimens, the steel against the steel specimens ha has, I mean, uh, includes some uh, unstability. So we can see that there is a wide band in its hysterical curve. Uh, but from this figure, we can know that this wide band is induced by the unstability rather than steel, uh, rather than stiffness or force uh, degradation. So, because if this wide band is induced uh, by the stiffness or force degradation, we would find uh, this N level should be from a high value to a low value. OK, fin finally, let's look at the contributions of the ski device to the PT frames. Uh, we tested three frames. The frame A is a bare PT frame, and space, uh, frame C is frame A with a ski device. Because the ski device provides two functions, additional damping and additional stiffness, so we designed the frame B. Frame B is frame A plus a special ski device. This key device can only provide additional stiff stiffness, but cannot provide any additional damping. We built model in open seas, and we tested uh, seven pairs of ground motions. Let's look at uh, the properties and the response. Uh, the first figure shows the uh, hysterical curves of these three frames. Uh, the red one is frame A, the purple one is frame B, and the the blue one frame C. So we can see that frame B has a higher stiffness than frame A, uh, but the frame A and frame B uh, don't have any hysteretic uh, damping. And frame C has the same stiffness with uh, frame B, uh, but the frame C uh, has a hysteretic damping. I mean, you know, it, it, it has a I mean, the, the hysterical curve voltage cover some area. Uh, the second figure, the blue lines in fact, second figure shows the hysterical curves of frame C. Uh, no, it shows the equivalent, equivalent damping ratio of the frame C. So from this figure, we can know that the, 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 the equivalent damping ratio of the frame is increasing with the drift ratio. Okay, so last figure shows the dynamic response of these three frames. Uh, we did IDA analysis. Uh, it means we use the same group of earthquake ground motions, but we scale the, 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 the intensities of them to different levels so that we, we can know the response of these 
these three frames uh, in different uh, uh, intensities. Uh, so the x axis of this figure is a roof drift ratio, and the y axis is uh, intensity. So from this figure, we can know that both additional damping and uh, additional stiffness contribute to the, re the response reduction of the frames. OK, thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Xiaoyang Chen. Today, I'll be presenting part of my PhD research entitled Assessment of stress passes around the larger diameter loaded piles on the lateral cyclic loading. So the topics uh, I'll introduce consists of the following five parts. First, background and the research strategy. Uh, as you know, the world is facing an unprecedented climate crisis, and uh, the green energy plants have been installed all of, all of the world. You can see here on right side how the off, uh, and the offshore wind uh, industry plays a key role. You can see here on right side how how the offshore wind capacities have been increasing in recent years. This is due to the uh, progressive increasing size of the offshore wind turbines uh, compares with the uh, Typical Boeing 747 airplane, you can imagine is how big of the recent installed offshore wind turbines. OK, if you uh, remember our first speaker, Ziliang, uh, part of his research focused on <coughs> simulating the reaction of the superstructure of the offshore wind turbine. And my research is going to be the underground part, which will be Mon Monopile Foundation. Monopile foundation have been typically the preferred foundation options for offshore wind turbine. Uh, for the design of the monopile foundation, lateral cyclic loading is usually considered, which is triggered by the wave wind and the rotation of the blade and the rotors. Uh, for better understanding the monopile behavior under such lateral cyclic loading, uh, the numerical modeling or PY curve methods are usually used, which uh, is usually uh, requires robust uh, uh, cyclic soil model. Uh, uh, however, the calibration of such a model is usually based on the laboratory testing. Typically, the soil elements in front of a lateral loaded pile is are simulated by trunk cell test, while the soil elements on the side of the pile are uh, simulated by a uh, shear test. Um, some research indicate that the stress conditions around the lateral loaded power is more complex due to the power lateral movement and uh, mm, power bending. So what is the uh, uh, real stress pass experienced by soil elements surrounding the lateral loaded power? Uh, research strategy. My research uh, uh, explored the stress paths through the numerical modeling, and the obtained the stress conditions will be imposed on the laboratory testing. However, prior to this, a uh, necessary assessment was performed to evaluate uh, the uh, relevance of uh, current uh, laboratory testing practice and provide suggestions for uh, reproducing this uh, stress uh, conditions or stress passes. And uh, in the end, the experimental results would be used to calibrate the uh, 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 finite element model, and they're gonna, they gonna uh, they are forming a loop. So the contents I'll introduce next will follow this uh, uh, technique route. First, finite ele element uh, uh, analysis. Uh, <clears throat> The, finite, the 3D finite element model was built on OpenSys platform. You can see here how the model can predict the increase in relative density and the progressive uh, displacement and the tilt of the power. This can be achieved due to the implement, implementation of an advanced constitutive model named the sunny sand memory surface. The sunny sand is a 
bounding surface plasticity model. And the memory surface is an additional surface which enables to uh, capture the steepening of soil to uh, predict the accumulated displacement of the soil. OK, as you know, the simultaneous control six stress components is impossible in uh, current laboratory testing and uh, current capacities allow for controlling uh, up to four stress components. So let's have a first. Let's have a look at how the uh, six stress components in soil elements change during the uh, cyclic load, uh, loading. Uh, I won't go to details to show the uh, stress components for all the soil elements around pile. Here I just uh, take the uh, soil element in front of pile as an example. As you can see, on the one-way cyclic lateral loading, obvious changes can be observed in the radial stress, the black line sigma x, and the sh one shear stress, uh, red line, tau z x, and uh, there also has two shear stress, tau x y and tau y z. They remain zero during the cycles. So here we can simply find these complex stress conditions into four stress components. Uh, actually, this is pre preferred for laboratory testing. This slide uh, summarizes the stress passes for uh, all the representative soil elements uh, in line with lateral loading. Uh, uh, generally, the stress pass considering the uh, uh, rotation principle stress is reported in these 3D uh, plots, which is shear stress versus steer rhetoric stress, and with an additional uh, stress axis to consider the intermediate stress, the uh, influence of intermediate stress. If you have a look at the results in figure B and E, this is main stress pass uh, plots, you can see all of these stress paths show, si uh, show similar trend, uh, which featured with the inclination varies from 30 to 50 degree. Idealized stress paths can be extracted from the uh, stable state uh, as marked in green line. So, assessment uh, next assessment of the laboratory stress passes so after we get the idealized stress pass then we we need to consider which test should be used and how to reproduce this uh, uh idealized stress pass this figure this figure uh compares the idealized stress pass uh, obtained from the numerical modeling uh with the available stress pass in hollow cylinder and the triangle cell test. You can see here, the hollow, the idealized stress pass can be well reproduced by the hollow cylinder test, but uh, if you have a look at this horizontal red line, it stands for triangle cell test. Clearly, this type of test cannot reproduce the uh, uh, development of uh, shear stress and uh, rotational principal stress axis. And uh, this, then the hollow cylinder torsional apparatus appear to be uh, appears to to be the only test devices which uh, has four degrees freedom. It can apply axial load, torsional load, inner and outer cell pressures on a hollow cylinder sh uh, shaped uh, sample, and uh, to reproduce the stress pass involving the rotation principle stress axis. OK, experimental tests. So after, as, as I said before, the idealized stress pass would be imposed on the hollow cylinder test. Uh, it tests with different axial stress uh, amplitude and torsional stress amplitude were performed on these devices. And these tests were designed to uh, simulate the influence of the rotation principle stress axis. What so? Why considering the rotation principle stress axis so important? Here I take three tests: C3, C5, and the C7 with a similar mobilized friction angle. Uh, as you can see here. Uh, 
Um, it is interesting to be noticed that uh, uh, significant uh, changes can be can be observed as the rotation principal stress r bar increase. Even this three tests, they have a progressive lower axial stress amplitude. One plausible explanation is due to the coupling effect between the axial loading and the torsional loading, which uh, causes uh, a redistribution of sand fabric. This feature may need to be captured by constitutive model for more accurate predict prediction of sort of response in multi-axial stress space. So conclusions from FE uh, modeling, we can extract the idealized stress path ex experienced by soil elements around the lateral loaded pile. And uh, this hollow cylinder torsion apparatus uh, is uh, proven to be the only test devices to uh, reproduce uh, this kind of uh, stress passes involving the rotation principal stress. And from exper experiments results, we can conclude that the rotation principal stress axis have a significant effect on accumulated strain of soil. And this feature may need to be captured by uh, the constitutive model. And uh, besides this, I would, I, I would like to stress that the traditional tests like uh, transfer test or hollow cylinder test will never be replaced by hollow cylinder test because it's too complex and uh, cost, cost, costly. And this research just aims to uh, point out the limitations of current laboratory practice for better uh, uh, laboratory testing procedures for the non-power design. Thanks. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.